I want to welcome you all to our third session in the Revelation study. Uh, we're going to be meeting every second Thursday of the month to study Revelation. And um, we're planning on getting through the book of Revelation in just an overview in this year. So don't think that you'll know everything by the end of this year about Revelation. This is to get you hungry for knowing more. So tonight we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, it's a passage of scripture that is, quite frankly, often neglected in the church. I don't know, uh, I know that Pastor Larry, just a few Sundays ago, he looked at the Laodicean church, the, the letter to the Laodicean church, and I'm actually going to pick that one out this evening as well as we get that far. Um, but for the most part, these letters are neglected because a lot of people don't really get the point or they don't necessarily like the message that they read. Um, so uh, if we neglect it, however, we do it at great peril because these are the chapters where Jesus defines what is necessary for his people to reach the basically the, the highest ideal in being prepared for God's end time plan, uh, for his heart, to understand his heart. So I want to briefly review uh, our first two sessions, very briefly, the things that we talked about. And again, I want to remind you, I am not your teacher, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. Uh, I pray every time when I get up and teach in front of people that God would hide me behind his cross that I would not be the one that is visible, but that he would be speaking to us. So uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal scripture to your heart. Uh, I invite you to go deep. As I said, this is designed to be an overview. It is not going to give you everything you need to know. The notes, we won't cover everything. Just take them home, look at them. Uh, go deep in the scriptures. And check everything that I say with scripture. I do not want you to just take something because Pastor Stephen says it. I'm not that important. So take everything that I say uh, in, in looking at the scripture and see if it is true. I uh, want to also remind you of the four views of the end times and just kind of remind you where I'm coming from. Uh, we have the various views, there's a handout for you if you're interested, if you didn't pick it up yet, uh, that talks more in depth about this. But where I'm coming from is this historic premillennialism with a victorious church going through the tribulation. So I do not believe in a rapture taking place before the tribulation. I believe the rapture takes place at the seventh trumpet. Um, and I'll be happy to uh, go into detail on that one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in knowing why I believe that way. Um, but we also will cover this uh, to an extent once we get to the trumpet judgments uh, in this study. Uh, session one, uh, just to remind you, the theme of Revelation is Jesus returning to take leadership of the earth in partnership with his people. So don't forget the partnership part, because that's the whole point of why he's writing this to us. If we weren't partnering with him, why would we care? Why would he write it to us? I mean, there is so much in the wisdom of God that he has not related to us because it's stuff that he does alone. It's stuff that only pertains to him. Why would he write so much scripture if it wasn't pertaining to us? So we need to understand that there is a partnership that is desired on the heart level uh, with God here. And uh, just remember that uh, we've been studying in Genesis about the... Um, uh, we're, we've gotten to the section now with Noah's Ark and the judgment that God sends in the flood. These passages of scripture that we're looking at, Gen, um, uh, Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, they are designed to be like an ark for us to be able to go through the storm that is coming. God has designed a perfect storm to come in the most positive sense, the perfect storm that, that is going to drive evil off the planet. His ultimate goal is to restore righteousness and meekness and humility. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on um, relating to uh, some of the Psalms that talk about the Great Tribulation. But God is raising up this ark 
Um, it, it's that Psalm 91 arc where uh, we abide in the shelter of the Most High. We are a protected people. He covers us with his feathers. It's a great picture that he gives to us. There's going to be safety. It'll be a spiritual and a physical safety throughout this whole judgment time that comes on the earth. There's going to be power. There's going to be miracles that take place. Uh, we, we think oftentimes when we think of miracles, we think of two different books. Uh, in, in one in the Old Testament, which is Exodus, where Moses uh, uh, brought the plagues on Pharaoh and his kingdom. Uh, and then we think of the book of Acts, where we have the miracles of the Holy Spirit doing work through the apostles. Those two miracle books, if you want to call it that, are going to be combined in what we see in Revelation. And it, these judgments are loosed through the praying church. Uh, it's interesting, we, we, we oftentimes have a hard time thinking about us being involved in releasing judgment. Um, but there's so much scripture that talks about that. You know, we don't have a problem thinking about Moses being the one that uh, brought, that loosed the judgments and bound the judgments, right? Scripture says very clearly, Moses did that. He went to Pharaoh, he said, this is what's going to happen. It, it happened, and then Pharaoh said, please make it stop. And Moses went and he prayed, right? We don't have a problem believing that. We don't have a problem looking at Acts and believing that the apostles did all these amazing things. Uh, it actually, I, I love the passage where it talks about uh, the handkerchief that uh, that had been, was it Peter uh, that had that handkerchief? It was in his, his possession and somebody touched it and they got healed. And it says in that passage, uh, though, those were unusual miracles, which means to me there were usual miracles, right? Now if you think about it, there being unusual miracles, that means there have to have been normal miracles that are taking place on a great scale. Now, imagine the book of Acts. We don't have a problem seeing the apostles have worked on that, but suddenly when we get to Revelation, and it's stuff that we haven't yet seen take place, we think, oh, well, that we can't possibly in, be involved with that. Well, why not? Why would God list it all for us? Why would he want our partnership throughout everything if it weren't that way? So, um, also to remind you of the overview of uh, the, the outline of Revelation, there are uh, these four parts, and in that fourth part, which is the battle plan, there's five chronological sections with five angelic explanations. So um, if you need the handout from session one, I have that downstairs. I can get that for you if you're interested and you haven't yet got it. Okay. Um, session two review, we talked about chapter one uh, of Revelation. Uh, we talked about the descriptions of Jesus, why they are foundational for uh, being prepared as the bride of Christ to uh, go through the tribulation, to see the judgments that take place, to understand his heart in that. Uh, this chapter 1 is really foundational to the entire book. It's Jesus revealing himself. Uh, remember, we talked about him revealing himself as the bridegroom king and as the judge. Uh, he, he's, he's a lover, he's uh, an authority figure, and he is the one who is just absolutely passionate over seeing righteous, righteousness restored here on earth. So these descriptions in chapter 1, they are going to be necessary for us to be able to be equipped for what is to come. Okay, uh, Roman numeral 3. Uh, in your notes. Le the letters to the seven churches, uh, we are talking about preparing ourselves to overcome and to operate in power. So the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, it's an eschatological book, which means end times. Uh, it's, it's like the book of Acts in that we're going to see the uh, outpouring of the Spirit in greater measure than we have ever seen on this planet before. It's going to be paralleled by the greatest outpouring of demonic activity. So there's both things that are taking place, both coming to fullness uh, here on earth. Um, uh, it's revealing the acts of the Spirit through the end time apostles and prophets and the praying church under Jesus' authority. These seven prophetic messages, they instruct us 
on how to prepare to partner with him in his worldwide actions related to his second coming. Jesus knows best how to prepare his own bride. I think we all would agree with that. Um, the problem is we don't often listen to what we need to do to be prepared as the bride of Christ. Um, Jesus described uh, where, where the saints gather on his terms according to his agenda, that is where they mature. That's where they can be entrusted with the power that is talked about throughout the book of Revelation. You know, if, if it is true that we are partnering with his heart in loosing these judgments and in causing them to be over, knowing at the right time when that is to take place, we need to understand his heart in these judgments and we need to be uh, able to be entrusted with this kind of power. Um, there's a, a twofold thing that happens in, in Revelation. Um, and, and chapter 2 and 3 is one of these key passages for the prayer movement and the prophetic movement to mature in. We actually, we live in a time of history where we have a great explosion of prayer movements. We have, uh, in fact, I, I just got an email um, this week from our former mission agency. Um, somehow they tracked us down and they said, um, we're doing a, a, a kind of a survey with our former missionaries. We want you to help us prepare the churches to reach the remaining unreached people groups. And they listed there were 3,800 unreached people groups according to current data. And an unreached people group is basically a group, uh, uh, whether it's a nationality or whether it's an ethnic group within a country, uh, that do not have the scriptures translated into their language, that don't have any known believers under them, and obviously no church there. Um, so 3,800 unreached people groups. Now, that may sound like a lot, but think about this. There are over 700,000 churches here in America alone. 700,000. There are 70 churches here in Quincy alone. Now imagine if every church said, I'm going to adopt a people group and I'm going to send a missionary from our church to go and to reach that unreached people group. Imagine if every church in the U.S. did that, 700,000 attacking 3,800 little people groups. I, that, that would be awesome, right? It's not that big of a task. We get to partner with his heart, and we need to understand Revelation 2 and 3 to be able to be prepared to have his heart for the nations. A lot of our churches, especially in America, were so complacent towards the lost. You know, we, we, we don't think about eternity until somebody dies, right? It's sad that we have that kind of perspective. Um, I think for me personally, the prayer room has really uh, encouraged me to understand eternity more as we've been praying for the persecuted church. We've been praying and asking God to protect his people that are in danger of dying. We've been praying for, for people who are on death row because of their faith. Uh, and, and actually, last week, we got uh, an email that uh, really, really upset me at first um, because it was saying that uh, uh, the pastor we've been praying for in Iran, that he had been put to death. And uh, so as I followed the, the trail of emails, came to find out that it was a premature report. Uh, he hasn't yet. So we can still pray that God would do a miracle and release him. But there, there's an urgency that is being created in those that are partnering with his heart. And the prayer movement is going to mature in the context of these two chapters. Because this is what is Jesus' heart for his church. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 2 through 3 is the place where the Lord connects us to his word, to his character, to his heart. To, to intimacy, righteousness, and meekness, and wisdom. It's the place that we get connected to him. Now, I, I want you to be blown away by this one verse. I didn't list it here because the, the effect has to be open the Bible and look. Because this is, you're not gonna, if it was just on the screen, you wouldn't believe it, okay? So John 14, verse 12, look that up in your Bible, and then let your jaw drop. John 14, verse 12, it says, this is Jesus speaking. Okay, Jesus, 
God himself, fully man, fully God, he is speaking and he says, most assuredly, okay, most assuredly that means you can really take this to the bank. Okay? This is something you can deposit and the money will be there. Most assured, assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, okay, do we believe in him? Yes, we do. So, he who believes in me, the works that I do, I, Jesus, the works that I do, he, the person who believes in him, will do also. Okay, wait, whoa, 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 stop there for just one sec, okay? What did Jesus do? Jesus healed the sick. He cast out demons. He multiplied the bread. He actually raised himself from the dead. Okay, this is Jesus. This is what he's saying, what he's going to do. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Okay, oh, okay. I mean, I mean seriously, greater works than these, that's our destiny in the Spirit. Just imagine that. I mean, let, let that sink in for a minute, what that means. When was the last time you were in church and you encountered God in his power. Yeah. That's what I thought. But wait a minute. Scripture is true, right? It, it says, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Jesus said that later on in context, he talks about sending the Holy Spirit, who is the one who empowers us to do things in unity with him. Now, if, if we get a, a, a little complex and say, ooh, I have the Holy Spirit, I can do whatever I want, I'm going to you know, blast somebody to pieces. Well, did you know that one of the disciples tried to do that? In fact, two of them? J James and John, they saw uh, the city that rejected Jesus. And, and they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy that city? And Jesus said, you have no idea what kind of spirit you have. You don't know me. And see, if we don't get connected with his heart in, in revelation, if we don't prepare ourselves individually and corporately, we will not have his heart in being able to be entrusted with such power to do greater works than what Jesus did. Uh, it just blows my mind to even think about doing greater things than what he did here on earth. Um, I mean, obviously it's in his power, but, but that, just, that just blows me away. So anyway, we need to really invest ourselves in the scriptures to get an understanding of what he is talking about here. Um, we need to be a prepared bride who is doing it all for the right reasons. And the right reason is because we love him and because we understand his heart for humanity. Um, another thing I want to say very clearly, uh, there's, there's a lot of teaching out there that says Jesus is going to come back any second now. That's not true. There are still some prophecies that need to be fulfilled before he's going to come back. He said very clearly at what point he's going to come back. So if we believe that he's going to come back any second, we're actually not understanding scripture. Uh, he said he's coming back when the spirit and the bride say come. Right? There is a unity there. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the church globally. Just look at it in Quincy and tell me that the church is in unity. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, does it? So we know he can't be coming right now because the church isn't prepared. They, uh, scripture says the bride has made herself ready. She has prepared she is in unity with the Spirit. She's crying out, come Lord Jesus. We studied in, in our Genesis study, we looked at 2 Peter last week. And we looked at how, where it says, we actually are able to hasten the day of the Lord. We are able to speed up the day of the Lord's coming by being in unity with the Spirit. If, our, if we as a church, I mean, even just... Even just First Union Congregational Church, if we could just get it together, 
right? And say, you know what? We want to be in unity as a congregation, let alone look at the other churches being in unity together. Just, just here. How hard can that be? <laughs> really? I mean, seriously, come on, people. It cannot be that hard. So anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. <clears throat> B. These letters show us the kind of church that Jesus is building and what his agenda is in them. He defines love and relevance on his terms. Uh, that's a really important statement right there. We have a culture in America that is so interested in being relevant to the secular world rather than being relevant to scripture. Right? Jesus defines in chapter 2 and 3, he says what a relevant church is in his eyes. But we're more interested in making sure that we have Starbucks coffee in our church and donuts and, and you know the screen and the band and, and all these things. And none of it is bad, but when it becomes your focus of trying to connect Jesus with people, it doesn't work. We can't try to be relevant according to the world. We have to be relevant according to the word. Okay, so they define the spiritual maturity necessary for the church under Jesus' leadership to pray to release God's judgment against the Antichrist in the way Moses released the ten plagues on Egypt and the apostles established the church in the book of Acts. So these seven letters, they show that kind of church that Jesus is building. They show his agenda. They show how he defines love and what he calls a relevant ministry and a relevant church. Actually, I, I, I wanted to have a picture of a relevant church up there, so I Googled it, right? I, I put Google Images, relevant church, and it brought me actually to relevantchurch.com. And you know what? It was so awesome. I typed in, I went to relevantchurch.com, and you know what happened? My antivirus program popped up and said, there's a virus on this site, you can't go there. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's awesome, that's the perfect picture. We cannot be the relevant church apart from the Word of God. There's viruses in everything that we try to do if it's not based on Scripture. I thought that was just perfect. In fact, I was then trying to find an email address to email the pastor and say, hey, you got a virus? Uh, you know, but, but anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm getting off. Okay, uh, I have to have a little fun, you know. Uh, they define the spiritual maturity that's necessary. That's the most important, the most key aspect. Uh, we need to be looking towards maturing in the faith. And so often we are just concerned with, um, with things that pertain to buildings or people or opinions or attitudes. We get so consumed by things that aren't important when we should be getting consumed by the Word of God. Uh, it's the clearest description in these two chapters of what relevance is in ministry. Uh, I desire, and, and I, I'm, I'm on the journey there, to really setting my heart towards that destiny. I, I, I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm on the journey. I, you know, I'm, I'm in the infancy of understanding what Jesus' desire is for the church. But I really want to encourage you to set your heart towards the same. Uh, just to, to go go together, go hard for God in whatever way you can. Make make everything that pertains to Jesus your priority. Um, the, you know, even the prayer movement, whether it's uh, whether it's what we do here or whether it's other groups that meet together, uh, we're in our infancy as far as understanding goes, is what prayer really does. I mean, I'm excited every time we get a praise report where somebody you know. God answered that prayer, and, and, and there's a little bit of surprise in me sometimes. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. God answered the prayer. But, you know, I mean, shouldn't I be expecting that he answered the prayer? Shouldn't I be praying in belief that he will, you know? So we're in our infancy. We're kind of like the three-year-old riding the tricycle that says, I want to be president. <laughs> right? So we need to understand um, God's heart. 
Uh, paragraph C, these letters define the truths and the focus necessary to equip the church to walk in love for Jesus. Our love is expressed as we obey his commands, as we heed his warnings, as we believe his promises, especially the 22 eternal rewards that are listed in these two chapters. There will be great challenge, but even greater reward. Uh, we're entering a season of history where the Spirit is speaking to the church to get the church ready. What's relevant in these two chapters is that this is a gathering place for for the Lord to come and visit His church? You know, I, I, I'm always amazed when in college, you know, uh, I, I read uh, a bunch of books that were required reading, and some of them were about revivals or uh, men and women that had sought revival. And it was amazing to me as I was reading these books and looking at these accounts. And since then, I've looked at a bunch of different revivals that took place. Every single one of them started in the prayer room. Every single revival started in the prayer room. And, and, and I think to myself, okay, well, books have been written, classes are being taught, churches are being edified in that direction. Why don't we get it? You know, why is it just the handful of people that start having a hunger for that? Why does it always have to start with just a handful? Why can't it start with the whole church right away? Now, if, if we could infiltrate the brains of people and, and help ourselves to see how God desires so much for partnership with us. You know, we, we, we pray for revival, um, but do we actually foster an atmosphere of revival? You know, what we do on a Thursday night, does, does it infiltrate our lives? Or, or does it just remain an act that we do one night a week?